Hey you folks, it's Nate. It's time I got back to the drawing board. We got a new setup today. It's pretty exciting. I'm actually at my drawing table. Um, so, uh, hope you enjoy that. Hopefully this is a little better quality. I think I might have some of those static issues worked out now. Uh, let me know if you see any, or more accurately hear any, in the comments below. Anyways, today we're back here with our last episode of the book club. I have Manga and Theory in Practice by Hirohiko Araki. And we're looking at his final example of uh, the theories in implementation. Um, this is uh, this is Araki walking us through uh, the creation of a one-shot entitled Thus Spoke Rohan Kishibe, Millionaire's Village. Um, and this is, I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like. So let's just dive into it. Um, he gives us some background on the, the work he was working on uh, when he was hired and uh, the fact that um, he wasn't really given any criteria into it. Uh, so he's just going to tackle it as a generic example of how he goes about creating any story. Um, keeping in mind that this is a 45-page one-shot and not part of an ongoing series, uh, which would be about 20 pages if it was a weekly or probably about the same length if it was a monthly. It would depend on the publication. I think some monthlies are about 30 pages, uh, but most of them are about 40. Um, so, where does it all start? It, the idea began with a conversation between owners of country homes. Um, and he says, when I was thinking up the story for Millionaire's Village, my first idea was a battle of manners. The idea was simple, but I thought it would be interesting. And uh, he talks a little bit about how he heard a conversation between two homeowners who lived on a mountain who were having trouble with mountain boars. And uh, he found this to be odd or a bit rude, considering that, you know, they had basically invaded the boar's homes to build their houses. Um, you can agree with that, you cannot agree with that, but this is where the idea came from. So that's an interesting germ of an idea, um, a battle of, of manners between uh, people in a place and that place itself. Um, Going forward, he says, decide on the story as you write it. I tell my editor what kind of, of manga I want to make, and I see what kind of reaction I get. If my editor responds with interest, it's fine to fire up my engines, but sometimes the reaction is not so enthusiastic. During the meeting, I have to be attentive to make sure I can tell the difference. Some editors can respond with criticism, and that applies not just to ideas, but to the finished product as well. Having your flaws singled out, such as being told that certain aspects of your manga are uninteresting, doesn't feel good. But you have to take the attitude of being grateful for the response, whatever it may be. Um, and that's really good life lessons for an artist that Iraqi gives you there. Uh, not always going to be editors for the Western creator, uh, especially if you're in the independent scene. You work um, without a, a publishing house or a... Um, editorial staff in mind. As I've said before, um, manga is serialized in an ongoing magazine that says kind of a house style and house expectations. Um, even if you're an in, you're just, if you're self-publishing, you know, you may be determined by what you have interest in, but uh, most artists have wildly differing tastes and, and desires to make very different things. Um, and, you know, so you, even that can be less restrictive than um, just the house style of your magazine or whatever. Uh, but you still need to find someone to run your ideas by. Uh, ideas may sound good to you on paper, um, but you still need to really get that feedback on them, whether it's from uh, another writer or another artist or or maybe you have an independent editor you like to work with, um, any of those things. If you don't get the feedback, you're missing out on something that can really help you determine whether you're on the right track or not. Um, and generally, unless you're paying money to an editor, um, nobody owes you their time. Always be grateful for that kind of feedback, uh, no matter how positive or negative it is. Um, and I think that's that's a very important lesson for artists to walk away with. And why is that? Well, Araki goes on to say, because manga is creating manga is a solitary endeavor, when you're in the thick of it, it can be hard to see if you're going in the right direction. 
That's why no matter what your editor's feedback may be, you should value it. That said, if you're unable to make the content of the crit unable to accept the content of the criticism as valid, don't force yourself to take what you heard at face value, but rather consider the feedback carefully. Something made the editor feel that way. You must find the truth hidden beneath the surface. If you look hard enough, you should be able to find some clue to how your manga can be improved. And this is also very true. Um, you know, feedback is, is feedback. Um, but it doesn't always get at the core of a situation. Uh, it doesn't always... Um, feedback is often provided with in, in this shape of, I didn't like this, or this didn't work for me, or could you change this to make the story work in this way? And all these things can go against the... Um, either don't provide direction for how you should change it, or they don't work within the larger context of what you're trying to do. And both of those things are problems. Um, but the fact that you're getting feed negative feedback on a point is itself an indication that something isn't firing on all thrusters. Um, you don't necessarily have to cater to the immediate demands of your editor or your audience if they are disliking something. But it doesn't mean you don't need to make a change because at the very least, you, and the idea that you're trying to communicate isn't coming through clearly. Um, so that's, uh, that's something you learn with experience, uh, learning to juggle that kind of feedback with your own vision. It's very easy, uh, especially for younger in age authors, uh, as opposed to younger and experienced authors. It's easy for younger in age authors to get carried away by um, the influence of other people. As you get older and you develop more confidence in yourself and uh, your storytelling and your style, Maybe not so much, um, but especially if you're uh, you're not yet, say, 25, um, that's something you really have to be on guard against yourself for. Now, many creative people have strong egos already, um, and they are they push very hard for their ideas, um, and that's good. It's also important to not push too hard because, again, if you're getting negative feedback on something, I mean, it doesn't always mean something is out of place. But it does mean you lost people at that point, and it's really important to understand why and whether you can fix that or you just have to be okay with it. Um, so here he talks about introducing uh, the first three pages offer a preview. Um, so he talks about introducing his characters. Uh, he shows his protagonist, Rohan Kishibe, and he's just warming up. And this is more to gain the attention of the audience. Um, and then he shows him in a meeting with his editor, um, you know, the young lady here. Um, so the conversation, uh, Iraqi says, in this conversation between Rohan and his editor, an unusual battle is already beginning. The two are not getting along particularly well, and their relationship is rife with conflict. While she doesn't rise to the level of antagonist, I'm signaling that she is going to do something to him that's not in his interest. Um... So I'm not going to read all this dialogue, but yes, it's very true. Um, she doesn't really seem to be paying attention to Rohan. Um, he proposes uh, a topic and she completely brushes it off, doesn't workshop at any, just counters with how about buying a summer home in the mountains. And that is, of course, what is going to lead to the primary conflict. So while she's not malicious, she has unknowingly set Rohan up for trouble. Um, so uh, Iraqi goes on to say, be become fond of your characters as you write them. Um, Rohan was originally meant to be a, a very small side character, um, really just uh, a few appearances in part four. And he's actually kind of gone on to become um, almost a stand-in for Iraqi in the story. Uh, and he talks a little bit here about both the creation of Rohan and the creation of this editor, who is not a recurring character in the story. Uh, as far as I know, only appears this one time. Um, and he says a, a few things that are uh, important about, you know, how your characters grow on you over time. Um, this passage I've highlighted here, uh, he just mentions some of the things that he um, put in Rohan's character design that make him very recognizable. Um, his headband and his hair, 
uh, serve to identify him at a glance, even in silhouette, if these two features are visible. He's recognizable as Rohan, business signification at work. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the larger um, thrust of uh, the example. I just thought it was interesting, but well, that's why it's there. Um, Ro uh, Araki talks about the decisive panel, where you know you have the reader. Uh, this is an interesting concept. I've never really thought that there should be one point in your story where, yes, your audience is all the way in, except maybe the first panel. Uh, obviously, Araki focuses a lot on suspense um, and building tension, so maybe that's not uh, where necessarily where he puts it. Again, his first panel, as you can see, is just these two hands stretching. Um, and that's intriguing. Um, and you have this voice talking. I'm not sure that if you were a less established author than Araki, you would want to start a manga that way. He he clearly can get away with that because people recognize his style and his name and will be interested in where his story goes. Um, but yes, uh, having a decisive panel, it is a very interesting idea. Um, but this is on, he doesn't get to it till page six of his 45 page story, more than 10% of the way through. Um, I, again, I, I am a little conflicted about this idea. You know, I think your decisive panel should tr at least be on the first page, um, or the first two pages, you know, at an absolute outside. Um, again, you can maybe get away with it a little bit more, given that this is Iraqi and he's established, um, and of course he has several pages with interesting dialogue and, and hints at them, but uh, I don't know. I don't know about this part. Um, so, but he says, uh, but no matter how quickly I wanted to get to drawing this decisive panel that kicks off the story, I couldn't start the manga there. I had to first get the readers to become interested in the characters. Um, so he backtracked to the opening scene and this discussion with the editor and Rohan. Um, and again, this is, uh, this is interesting, you know, where you start your story and where its most interesting point are. Can you get them to line up? Uh, is it good to go back a little bit before them to get a running start? Um, I think these are things that you have to work out by feel uh, and to turn for your own style of storytelling. Because again, um, Iraqi is very invested in suspenseful storytelling and maybe having... Um, a really strong beat to start out with doesn't doesn't jive with that kind of suspenseful storytelling. Also, this panel here, uh, this overhead shot of um, this little settlement in the woods, is his his buy-in panel, and I, I don't know as it, it would really grab me. I have actually read Millionaire's Village in its entirety. It's a pretty good story. Um, again, very suspenseful, lots of uh, cerebral head games in it. Um, I like it, but I, I don't know, as if I had just picked it up off the shelves, um, that this would be the, this would be a story that I would complete if I hadn't known who Iraqi was already. So, um, yeah, there is that. Moving on, uh, curiosity is Rohan's motivation. Rohan's flaws or weaknesses, depending on how you look at it, is how he lets himself be swayed by the editor's suggestions, rather than persisting in his own idea having to do with annual eclipses. I don't want to make a manga about heroic characters all the time. When I can, I like to put in flawed human characters. Um, I don't know as Rohan being influenced by this editor's suggestion is a flaw or a weakness. Um, yeah, it rather seems to me just to be... Uh, accepting a suggestion. I do know that a lot of manga protagonists tend to be very stubborn and single-minded. That That's often viewed as an admirable trait, at least in fictional characters in Japan. So perhaps this would be viewed as a flaw or a weakness, um, taking feedback. Of course, you know, Araki has just said, listen to feedback as it comes in. Uh, but then again, a character in a story and what you would do in reality are two very different things. So um, there's that. So we're now we're done with the key in Kishoten Ketsu, or uh, the introduction, um, and we are moving on to the development. 
The two venture toward an unusual situation and they seem to pair well as characters. But one thing uh, I don't do, I being a racky, is have them backtrack for any reason. Um, and this is, uh, this is an interesting point, um, an interesting adaptation of, you know, the hero is always rising, which was one of his principles of storytelling. Um, at no point do the people ever consider backing out of Millionaire's Village. And that is an interesting part of um, Iraqi storytelling. They never back out to do research. Uh, they're always in the thick of the, pro the problem. And there are a lot of good reasons for that that he builds into his story. Um, so if you want that to be a part of your storytelling, always make sure your scenarios are built to mostly preclude the option of backing out. Um, and again, this is, you, you might argue with uh, this way of storytelling, but this is Iraqi's method in practice. This is how he thinks and goes about building it. Um, and I think it's interesting that you would set that for yourself um, but after setting it for himself, one of the things he notes about this village is like it's not accessible by road. You have to fly in by helicopter or walk. Um, so that's a pretty good way of enforcing that rule on himself. His characters cannot back out once they're in the thick of things. So, um, yeah, just making sure your principles are not sloppily applied, but being thorough in it uh, is very important. So, um, Araki says, uh, the basic approach in a one-shot manga is to limit the number of characters, but to fully flesh them out. The key number is three, protagonist, adversary, and ally. Um, I like that. Uh, I have often struggled with writing shorts myself, uh, and I think it's often because I try and put too many characters into them. And I think I've rebounded on that by cutting it down. I, I typically only have two, um, Either protagonist and ally, and the adversary is something about the situation, uh, like a, a disaster or um, something like that. And then, um, or just having protagonist and adversary. But I think this this uh, trifecta is very important uh, because without an ally to the protagonist, as well as an adversary, I don't think you can fully flesh them out. Um, one of the things Iraqi notes in here is that Rohan really becomes um, invested as the protagonist uh, once the, his ally, the editor, is put in danger, which she is. Uh, um, she actually walks him full steam into trouble here. Um, but he still, he still struggles to protect her because he's the protagonist, and that's what protagonists especially shonen protagonists, which again is what Iraqi is writing about, um, they, they strive to protect people. Um, anyways, uh, here we have the introduction of the antagonist, or at least the person who personifies the antagonist. Um, this is given entirely from Rohan's point of view. A young child opens the door, um, has a very blank, staring, wide-eyed expression that can be a bit creepy, especially since the child is not smiling. Uh, the child then proceeds to speak in extremely formal language. Um, now, it may not strike you as extremely formal. Uh, the translation here has um, emphasized vocabulary. Uh, I don't know as that's necessarily the case. Of course, a lot of the formal gestures that the child makes are formal to Japanese people and so don't necessarily translate well. Um, So, um, in addition to the uh, introduction of the guide um, as silent, expressionless, and uh, more intelligent than he should be, um, he also shows uh, a level of coordination that is unusual. Um, and, uh, like, he's carrying this large tray. He serves the, tray, the tea perfectly. Um, uh, this this kind of formal kneeling uh, was a big part of, um, I, I don't know what the right term is, but uh, um, the aristocratic um, culture of Japan, 
especially in the feudal era, I believe. Um, I'm not an expert here. And um, when I was reading this, uh, many of the things that the child did didn't translate. Um, but the reactions of the characters were strong enough that you could feel that there was something off about this. And that's something I think that Iraqi has a good command of um, in his draftsmanship. So, uh, using manners as a battle. At first glance, a battle of manners seems rather low-key, but I'm still following Shonen Manga's Royal Road. I lay the groundwork by showing the editor making various faux pas, while the boy continues to have impeccable manners, and the scene builds through a 10-10-10 structure typical of Shonen Jump battles. When the protagonist does something, the enemy responds, and when one surpasses the other, the other takes it to the next level. The boy places their cups, then, and they have to decide how to take them. The boy offers corn, and everyone has to find the correct way to eat it. Um, so this stuff seems very inconsequential, but the whole point of this scenario is that each of these things is actually quite dangerous. Um, the editor finds out members of her family have died in a, a car wreck, um, and she's at this top point made, I believe, two faux pas, and so she's lost two members of her family. Um, and that's, you know, that adds that element of consequence, of danger to the battle. And of course, every time that our protagonists rise to the challenge um, of good manners in this situation, uh, the boy escalates it by giving a new situation where they have to behave appropriately. Um, that's, that's very um, appropriate. It is... It is the raising of stakes, and then in a such a mundane seeming place that it can come off as as very unsettling. Uh, a great way to build suspense. Um, Araki says uh, in this story, I don't believe that Rohan cares much for the editor, but when she winds up in danger, he can't make himself abandon her, even if the battle to save her is one where he is at a disadvantage. This exposes a kindness beneath his cool exterior. If he were to say, I'm not sure I can win this one, I'll just go home instead, that would be moving in a negative or falling direction. The story must always move in a rising direction, and in this case, that means solving the mystery and continuing onward. Again, Iraqi's um, particular demands of um, shonen storytelling coming through there. Always keep these characters moving on to the next thing. Don't allow them to backtrack. Um, ending with defeat is acceptable, he says. And this is something that I don't think you would ever see in modern comics. Um, but if at some point, you know, he got his characters into a place they couldn't get out of using their skills and abilities, Iraqi would be okay, he says, with giving them a downer ending. In fact, um, twice protagonists in JoJo's, uh, JoJo's segments have been defeated. And uh, those were quite, quite serious and unsettling defeats to see uh, at the end of parts one and, and to a large extent at the end of part six. Um, Iraqi concludes, if I ever wrote a character into an utterly unwinnable situation, I would rather have that character lose with honor and bravery than to rely on outside force. Um, he considers this part of his um, pay into humanity, the, the adaptability, intelligence, and power of the human spirit. Um, so uh, that's why he wouldn't give himself an easy out. Maybe that would work in some stories, um, but this is not one of them. Um, so finally, from short form to long form, um, Araki says, you just, you just do what you did more uh, on a bigger scale. Um, you can think of longer form manga as simply building upon the same things you did for short manga or possibly repeating them. Um, and he recommends you practice writing short form stories before you go for anything long term, which is good advice, um, in my humble opinion. So Araki concludes um, with a little more philosophical musing. Um, how do you draw a manga? Is there a right way to do it? Is there a wrong way to do it? Um, do you strongly disagree with everything he's put forward in the book? Uh, that's fine. He says, uh, you know, uh, this is, he thinks of these as guideposts to be returned to, uh, unless a um, ironclad manual that must always be followed to the letter. Uh, I think most artists, of course, would come to a book like this with that understanding to begin with. Um, it's, 
it's a fairly straightforward deduction to make. Uh, and it, you have to be creative in creative endeavors. Um, at the same time, there are rules of presentation and craftsmanship that really help you get your point across uh, when you stick to them. And that's mostly what Iraqi has put forth. Um, he makes that very clear when he says, the golden way is not a manual to creating MAGA. The golden way is a path to further developing your craft. It's the path to get you from where you are to where you're going. It's the path to help you search for where you go next. Um, finally, he concludes by uh, acknowledging the editor who took his first manuscript when he was 18 and retired, uh, I believe the year before he started writing this. Is that correct? Do, 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 do. Um, oh, maybe. No, he retired the year he wrote this. Um, so there you have it. <clears throat> Um, so he kind of thought that he would set all this out uh, as, as a, a passing the torch moment. His editor was moving on. Um, of course, at this point in his career, Iraqi is now uh, a experienced, well-respected veteran with 30 years in the field. And um, he thought it appropriate to write it all down and, and pass something on to the next generation uh, in the hopes of helping them. And I hope that going through the book with me uh, has been... Um, useful to you. I I haven't covered nearly everything here. That's deliberate. Um, I've just hit the biggest highlights that I saw. And of course, um, there are lots of examples and uh, lots more of interesting stories and um, bits of craftsmanship that Iraqi has to share in it. So I, if you've been interested in what you've heard here, I'd strongly encourage you to check that out. Um, let me know what you thought of this last chapter down in the comments below. And also, if there are any more books of this type that you would like to see me do uh, a book club on, I've enjoyed doing this. Um, and I would like to do it again in the future. I don't know exactly what the next thing I will be looking at will be, um, but there you have it. So um, do tell me if there's anything you'd like to see examined in this way or just... Um, see me do chapter-by-chapter uh, chapter videos on. And, uh, and that's all I got for today, so I'll talk to you later.